So good afternoon and welcome to this uh, second session of This is Film, a Film Heritage in Practice. Um, this is a special session uh, because we are also celebrating the closure of the um, Scholar in Residence uh, program of the past couple of years, but more about that in a second. So uh, my name is Giovanna Fossati. I'm the chief curator at IFIL Museum and a professor, um, professor of film heritage and digital film culture at the University of Amsterdam. This is film uh, is a collaboration with IFIL Museum, the University of Amsterdam, and the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis um, that started uh, um, eight years ago. Um, um, yes, eight years ago. Um, and uh, this uh, series uh, um, is carried out uh, in the framework of the class this is film. So the master students that follow uh, this class at the university uh, also um, uh, contribute to the program and they introduce our guests and ask them questions. Um, as you can see, we uh, record the sessions and as we've done in the past two years, uh, the uh, recorder sessions will be made available on the I YouTube channel. Uh, so if you want to re re uh, review uh, uh, past the sessions, uh, you can find them there. And in with a few weeks delays, you'll find the current sessions uh, published online. Also, a number of films uh, screened during the series uh, will be made available um, on the I Film uh, player. Um, This year's edition uh, focuses on the theme activating the archive, uh, which will also be the topic of the um, eighth I International Conference uh, that will take place uh, in early June. Uh, with more than 40 speakers from around the world, the conference will focus on how audiovisual archives can stimulate uh, people to engage with specific social and political uh, causes, support the efforts of uh, um, activists, uh, or be uh, um, used as uh, uh, or communal resources uh, through global and local uh, projects and collaborations and from inside as well as outside uh, uh, the film archives. So if you are interested, uh, um, we'll publish the complete program shortly. Um, so the reason why we started This Is Film, and those of you who have been to sessions of This Is Film already know that, I think, um, is because we felt uh, that what happens behind the screen uh, of a film archive is still quite unknown to the general audience. With audiovisual content being added to streaming platforms at the rate of millions a day, we don't realize that the vast majority of films created in the past 120 years is still hidden in the vaults inside film cans. Based on a rough estimate, less than 20% of archival films has been digitized, and much less is available online, just to be clear. Uh, and that's mainly for copyrights reason, but that's a completely different story. Um, and this is the case that approximate 20% of films being digitized is the case only in Europe and North America, whereas uh, uh, the, um, their archival counterparts in Asia, Africa, and Latin America are lagging behind. While the costs of uh, digitization and long-term digital preservation are barely affordable for richer audiovisual archives, uh, they cannot be met by smaller archives uh, and archives in low and middle income countries. During this is film, we discuss how films are collected, preserved, and restored, and we hope to stimulate a curiosity that goes beyond films available in cinemas and online. Even more importantly, we want to look critically at what has been collected and preserved and what has been lost and why. Finally, we want to promote uh, um, a discussion with colleague, colleagues and the audience to reactivate archival films and, uh, and film collections in new and unexpected ways. 
Besides this is film, there are other programs uh, that have been initiated by IFIL Museum to promote the activation or reactivation of uh, uh, film archives from different and novel perspectives. One of such initiatives is the Artist and Scholar in Residence program that uh, we started in 2017, uh, shortly after the I uh, Collection Center was opened. Since then, we have uh, invited the three artists and three scholars to engage with the collection. Last year, we had uh, Imran Channa as our artist in residence. Among other projects, uh, Imran reactivated the landscapes he found in archival films shot in the 1910s and 20s and early 20s in the former Dutch colonies through an artistic video game. At the same time, uh, the scholar in residence, researcher and curator uh, Amal Alag, uh, was looking at the home movies shot in the same period by Dutch families living uh, in the Dutch East Indies, looking for gestures of refusal and dissent by domestic workers portrayed in these films. So today, Amal uh, and her guest, Barbie Asante and Jeffna Patikava, will lead us through uh, uh, these findings. Now, I would like to introduce uh, four students, five students, Bruno Luberti, Tessa McDonald, uh, Amber Mota, Ines uh, de la Puente Rakosnik, Gianna Van Stockum, who are students at the, of the This Is Film class. And on behalf of the whole group, I'd like to call Tessa to introduce our guest. Amal Ahang is an Amsterdam-based curator, researcher, and co-founder of several initiatives, including Metro 54, a platform for experimental, sonic, dialogic, and visual culture, and The Side Room, a room for eccentric practices and people together with artist Maria gogan Blakler, which ran from 2013 to 2016. Since 2015, Amal has developed an ongoing collaboration with Framer Framed, befriending artists, organizers, curators slash cultural producers, academics, activists, and organizers on programs that range from gatherings to group shows, film screenings, and parties. In 2019, Amal co-initiated the ongoing collaborative project Diasporic Self, Black Togetherness as Lingua Franca in collaboration with artist and curator Barbie Asante at Framer Framed in Amsterdam and at 198 Contemporary Arts and Learning in London. In 2021, as part of the Metro 54 team, she collaborated with Rita Wedraugu on a funeral for street culture, a multidisciplinary group project at Framer Framed in Amsterdam. Additionally, in 2022, she received the Academy Arts Medal from the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. Currently, she is part of the Quadrennial Sunsbeek 2020 to 2024 in Arnhem, Netherlands, Senior Research and Public Programmer at the Research Center for Material Culture, Netherlands, and Curatorial and Research Fellow at Mataf Arab Museum of Modern Art in Doha, Qatar. Amal develops ongoing experimental and collaborative research practice, public programs, and projects in global politics, archives, colonialism, counterculture, oral histories, and popular culture. Her projects and collaborations with people, initiatives, and institutions invite, stage, question, and play with uncomfortable issues that riddle, rewrite, remix, share, and compose narratives in impermanent settings. Please welcome Amal. Yes, um, thank you so much, Tessa. That was the sweetest introduction. Although, um, I, um, as a joke, since last year I turned 40 and then I started quitting different institutional places. So, <laughs> in, 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 in the joyful, conclusive mode, I'm um, very honored um, and glad to be here. It's always a joy and um, a nice moment to hang out with archives, to bring trouble to the place, um, to see what it means to be collecting dust. Um, and I would like to also thank the team of I. Um, well, always, I start with the producers and people on the ground. So Tessa, thank you so much for also sending me text messages, you know, 
this is, I guess, the backstage of films. So I can talk about it. Um, Dorette, thank you so much for the small conversations we had. Uh, Giovanna and um, Eleni for the invitation and the multiple conversation for a very prolonged residency uh, um, due to the pandemic. And um, thank you for those of you who showed up during the daytime. I know many of you have to be at work and do many other things, so it's nice that you managed to be here. And very much gratitude to um, Jephta and Barbie who are here to be in conversation today because I think one of the key words that you heard in Tessa's um, introduction, it was about collaboration. I think all wonderful things in life are always collaborative with people. And I think also the complexities of the archive should be discussed in collaboration. Therefore, research is, in my practice, always in collaboration with other people. So, dispossessed archive, subversive laughter, and colonial headaches. So, it's, it's a part of a series of dispossessed notes that I have been working on, that have been taking the shape of radio shows, um, different formats um, really to kind of think through this idea of what it means to sit with histories and to me this is another iteration of that what does it mean to sit with the histories um, the histories that you know echo to the forefront that come to the forefront in the archive so in a way it's also an invitation to attune to the um, marginal figures people who are made marginal archetypes, the extras, the audiences, the fillers, the bystanders, the cleaners, the silent, the unhoused and the unhousable, nomads and troublemakers in the archive. My work, your work in society. I think about how we sit with these violent hierarchies in the afterlife of colonialism and slavery. I want to attune to these everyday ways of being as philosophies that don't necessarily triumph but are equally present in the Achilles Achilles of the world. A small preface. This collection of the I Film Institute is forever connected to the Cousin Archive collection of the Tropa Museum, part of the former Colonial Institute, which film and sound collection was dispersed over the I Institute and the Sound and Image Institute in Hilversum. This happened after the financial cutback in 2012, 2000. Um, 13. I guess it's also um, a very important historical moment in Dutch cultural and um, museum era. Um, it affected many of our realities, but also affected how archives moved from places to places. I want to acknowledge that this is also an exercise of a lifelong project um, to decolonize, or to do colonial, decolonial work um, and anti-colonial work, I should say, is a lifelong project. And I gained many questions that I would like to offer up for discussion. So this afternoon, I consider it a fabulation. The film, ex a remix film excerpts that you will see is a proposition of how to sit with these histories. Um, I, call, I call it often um, a fabulation, but also a proposal for subversive strategies on how to actually work through the colonial archive. And it is to centralize the unprofessional, to think about what that means in the archive, because to decolonize means that we have to dismantle many of the perceived ways of relating to these archives. Um, and I will save you the trouble of the technical terminologies, but really centralize the beings, the people that are captured in these films. Um, I also want to return a bit to um, that I'm very much um, pleased that Barbie Asante, I should say Dr. Barbie Asante, <laughs> and uh, um, artist curator and also art, I would say curator filmmaker, organizer Jefta Patikawa, who's also part of the National Archive, or should I say another colonial archive <laughs> that one can relate to. And I'm very excited to also be in conversation with them in a bit. So to think together on the impossibility of sitting, shifting, living, hanging out with the archive, which I will not define for you, but I will point towards its inherent desire. And here I echo um, towards focus on the past often diverts us from the present injustices for which previous generation only set the foundation. 
To hang out and dig deep in the archive is to be haunted by how its images and violences sit comfortably in the collective memory of the Netherlands. The white, uh, the white of the costume of the Dutch officers, the Indonesian servants, the trees that witnessed for decades the colonial scenarios, the violence, the abusive hierarchies, and the violent bureaucracy. The call to kiss the feet of the master, the long warm warm days, and the zooming of the mosquito. Time remixes itself when you hang out with these films. When one at all, but also when one attempts for months on end to observe against the grain and listen to the colonial archive. Images and home videos of white Dutch colonial officers depicting daily village life, traditional rituals and mundane domestic acts, and work in what was then known as the Dutch East Indies have left a last impre lasting impression. Here I want to highlight what it means to know the colonial filmmakers. The officers, such as Lamster, a short biography of Lamster from the iFilm Institute, would go as follow. G.C. Lamster was a soldier, cameraman, and a curator. At the beginning of the 20th century, he served as a soldier in the Dutch East Indies. During a leave in the Netherlands in 1911, he was commissioned by the Colonial Institute in Amsterdam to shoot footage in the Dutch East Indies. He was chosen on the advice of former General von Hoetz as one of the few officers with an interest in the local population and the culture. He sometimes staged scenes and always filmed from one perspective, namely the medium long shot. So how does one wrestle with this position of Lamster? How does one sit with his shots? How does one also sit with the career one was able to build? An archive does not happen on itself. It's also carried and held by people. What happens when we drop this archive deep, deep into the ground? Or when we pick it up with the communities whose life are depicted? So I also think about this idea of staging the archive. What is authenticity? The class diction of the Dutch of the voiceover that has shaped how we have come to know the culture, Indonesia, Dutch Indies, but also the gendered ways Asian racialized tropes illustrate Dutch nostalgic memory. In the past years, I can think of only one activating that played a big role, one activation that played a big role in how the archive was activated. I think here of the film Babu, which is a fictional story of Alima, who seemed to enjoy her life in the colonial world, which she had never been a part of. Let's call it what it is, a nostalgic colonial dream of giving voice, centralizing a young Indonesian domestic worker in the story of filmmaker Sandra Behrens. Things can be beautiful and disturbing. They can come together. There is no binaries between these complexities of holding space. But if we are centralizing an Indonesian young, wo wo young woman's life world, why is the film titled Babu, a word invented by the Dutch to describe the domestic worker or the position of the domestic worker? When I speak of the afterlife of colonialism, I'm speaking about Babu. Its conceptualization symbolizes the way this past shapes how the complex and layered contested history is remembered, written about, recorded, and witnessed. If anything these histories show us is that we still think in Hollywood modes, the villains and the good people, or maybe that's like a Christian notion of the good person and the bad person. And I bring this idea of good and evil to the forefront because I think in order to dismantle and to actually decolonize our relationship to these archives, we also have to consider the life worlds that facilitate it. Religion, language, our bodies, body politics, and also representation. If we're going to dismantle, we have to also dismantle how we envision representation. How are people represented in these imageries? Did they have the right? I think we have a lot of work to be done on accountability but also agency and the question of ownership. Who owns these archives? To whom do they belong? And how can we complicate those who it belongs to? Does it belong to Lamster or does it belong to the people that are depicted? Whose authorship do we centralize? Who has no authorship? So this specific colonial past and its afterlife is present in almost every fabric of Dutch society through language, embodiment, family histories, food, and somehow this specific colonial relation is often summarized as a sweet, tropical dream. Be all, but we all know that one person's dream is another person's nightmare. And despite the nightmare, 
people who have subjugated, who are subjugated to the Dutch Empire and its documentation managed to keep and remain self-determined, unruly lives. And I want to centralize the unruliness of that alphabet of gestures, the ways people make movement for themselves. So this speculative proposition is, to, is a toast to the wayward domestic workers, the laborers captured by history in a moment that lasts decades, that lasts forever while collecting dust in the peripheries of the archive. I'm interested in listening to these dust collectors. What happens when we listen to that question? What worlds unfold? In Lose Your Mother, Sadia Hartman puts sharply into words the question that I would like to invite you to meditate on. How can narrative embody life in words at the same time respect what we cannot know? If I would gift you one thing, I would gift you the gift of not knowing. Sometimes it's okay to not know. So we do not need to know Babu's real name because Babu was not able to speak to us. Her name was not Alima. And it's okay to actually think alongside the unknown. And it's in that unknownness that I want to keep us listening. So how does one listen for the groans and cries, the undecipherable, the songs, the crackle of fire in the cane fields, the lament for the dead and the shouts of victory and then assign words to all of it? Is that even possible? In practice, I want to experiment with the idea of tr troubling the colonial gaze that is always hierarchical and imprisoning the subject. And despite this, what spaces have people carved for themselves to reconfigure and renegotiate with these archives? As much as these colonial archives and collections are spaces for histories of colonial re relationalities, they're never equal. They can never be equal. As much as so many of those colonized can hang out with them, just us spending time does not make them equal. Then we move to the space of equity and transformative justice. Can an archive hold space for transformative justice? What does that mean? What is the I archive telling us? How does one face its whiteness? How does, in whose life is the backdrop to this colonial nostalgic dream? Similar colonial narratives, gaps, and historical silences rest comfortably in the collections and archives of institutions across the world. By considering the afterlife of the colonial gaze and the way it attempts, it in way it attempted and failed to hijack people's agency and ownership of the image and narrative. I want to actually think about that. So how can we consider this afterlife more present than these pasts? Because I think so many of us are working through the past, but the past are very much in the present. And in what shape do they take the present? What does it actually say that at the moment so many of us are working with these archives? Are we running away from the present? Are these dispossessed archives then truly the impossibility of refusal and dissent and can we listen to the coded gestures that domestic workers and other beings offer to their superiors? This alphabet of gestures that I've been thinking about and that you might see in the following video, I would say video remix videos, actually shows many different things, but at the same time, it doesn't show anything. And it's that not anything, that non-thing that is showing that I want, would like to invite you to attune to. So for today, we will sit with many of the questions in the conversation with Jeff and Barbie. And I really look forward into kind of rethinking and thinking about what it means for all of us to witness these records, but also think about the ecology of witnessing and the ecology of classification and the ecology of actually spending time, but also the professionalism of the institution and how this is often guarded away from people that might need to engage. What space is there then for the Indonesian, Moluccan, Papua New Guineans who can maybe rewire these archives and collections differently? Where are their voices? And at the same time, let's avoid essentialism. Let's be indeed maybe in conversation, but in somehow, some way, avoid taking up too much space. So this is an invitation to be in conversation and not to take up too much space. So thank you so much. And I would like to invite you so we can watch together. And after that, I give the floor to Barbie. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for that, Amal. So I was just thinking when you were doing your brilliant um, introduction, why did you invite me? <laughs> but then perhaps I have some things to um, to put into the room here. That um, So I'm going to start with a quote from my friend's new book, my friend Foluke, uh, somebody who, I, who is a therapist actually, described herself as a therapist. And when I was thinking about this, just now I thought about um, my another artist friend of, from, of mine, an Aboriginal artist called um, Brooke Andrew, um, was asked in um, an event at Tate, Britain, and, um, which was around the Artist and Empire exhibition. How do you do, you know, he's like, how do we take on decolonial work? And uh, Brooke said, well, therapy helps and I think it's a very it was a interesting proposition because also people were like oh my god what's he talking about but actually it's this this whole practice of care that has to come about within the kind of thought of kind of doing and I won't say archival work but I'd say mem memory work within the and and that therapy or the therapeutic because I won't talk about therapy um as this book unruly therapeutic doesn't talk about therapy per se and is about decolonizing and also abolishing therapy as we know it um but Foluke speaks about the archive quoting um Sadia Hartman the idea of critical fabulation I'll start there critical fabulation by playing with and rearranging the basic elements of the story, by representing the sequence of events in divergent stories and from contested points of view, I have attempted to jeopardize the status of the event, to displace the received or authorized account and to imagine what might have happened or might have been said or might have been done. The critical. I thought it was on account of race, but some things are possible, are impossible to verify. This was one of those things. Everyone would have denied it. They would have said that I was making it up. They would have asked, where is the evidence? Where are the receipts? They would have said, did say, in fact, that I had a chip on my shoulder. I didn't really get what they meant by this, but it was clear that the chip on the shoulder was not a good thing to have. Having a chip meant that you had a problem or worse, that you were a problem. While it is impossible to verify it, it is also impossible to feel and see. I saw it in people's eyes and actions when their bodies recoiled ever so slightly at my presence, when they touched and picked my hair. I was told that they were being kind that they were just curious, that their intentions were good. I was told that kindness and curiosity could not be racism. I was told that racism could not be verified, that the evidence was subjective and emotional and weak, and that it could not be backed up. Can you back it up? Or where is your archival evidence? We find ourselves not properly archived, unverifiably, um, unverifiable. The archive here was taken to mean a place where things are properly recorded. The archive bulging with properness and property supposes that it is, ma it's, it is made of everything significant. What is it? What it is, is everything that it warrants remembering. The car archive is a warrant, in fact a legal permission to say what has been what has been and what has not and what is not sorry and what is and what is not authority to say what cannot possibly be because it is not here and therefore cannot be proved and what it what is and is not backed up the archive becomes where life disappears, where happenings not properly recorded, recorded did not happen. The magician's box where we pull the curtain back to find what 
has not been verified, has disappeared, and that it did not verifiably exist. So if the archive is the house of the ruler, the architectural storage space of documents and, you know, what happens to our memories? What happens to the memories that, you know, belong to me and people like me? My engagement with archives has never been formal. Um, it's also been minimal. I am too impatient and too curious and perhaps too rebellious to be able to contend with, contend with all the formality of the archive. Also, like many other spaces, I am disturbed by spaces that kind of feel like they enclose history. They feel kind of violent to me uh, in those boxes and the walls and the structures. Um, there's something about the way that things are contained, and particularly in relation to bodies that have colonial gendered or histories of, you know, different history, different sexuality histories. Um, I was thinking yesterday as I arrived with Carmen Maria Machado. She talks about in her book, In the Dream House, how stories are destroyed in the archive or not even on it. And I want to think about how we start to honour them um, and how we start to kind of think differently about them. So for me, I have been looking, thinking with, um, you know, who am I about? I've been thinking about my Akan Ghanaian heritage and the principle of Sankofa. So Sankofa is, is symbolised, it's part of the Adinkra um, communication system and it is symbolised by a bird with its head turned backwards taking an egg or looking after an egg on its back. And simply it's been defined as go back and get it. And for me, in an attempt to understand what Sankofa means as a reluctant archivist, I look for material I can find in the unconstituted archive of my world. I'm interested in traces and fragments and whispers and shouts that hide documents and things in between, the stories that are not told the layout of spaces and why of the cataloguing and the categorizations. I am interested in what's not there or not allowed in or that haunts the official stories. And while I'm there, the Sankofa bird often whispers to me, alive amongst the dead records, telling me to look in places other than the official for the things that I need to archive. She whispers to me of places to find materials, of events and streets and people. She makes me look at brickwork and trees and plants, on market stalls and in hairdressers, in dance moves and in poetry, at the protest and in the church or the mosque, in libraries and record collections. She takes me to look at rare films posted on YouTube or that are only available on DVDs from Swiss film distributors. All these films made by African filmmakers, but not so readily available. I look at problematic colonial clips from Pathé news reels, telling stories of independent African countries still managing to centre the former, the former colony. So I think with um, Crystal Temple, whose extensive research on Sankofa proposes that Sankofa instructs us to return, to reclaim, to recover the past so that we can move forward. She proposes its use as a literary paradigm, as a way of using literature or storytelling, as I've gone to uh, critical fabulation with uh, Sadia Hartman before, to understand the past, present and future. She's interested in the concept of return and proposes for us some categories of return. Voluntary return, involuntary return or arbitrary return, supernatural return, tragic return, spiritual return, heritage return 
and revolutionary return. I'm going to leave the returns here and we can probably come back to them in the conversation. But what I will say right now is I am ambivalent to returning because where are we returning to? Our journeys are unmappable. Many begin at a door, a door of no return to connect and to think with the on brand. A threshold where everything you thought you ever knew changes forever. When I was a small girl growing up in the suburbs of London, the Sankova bird was not as subtle, subtle as she is now. She was not telling me her secrets. She came through the voices of my mum and dad in everyday Akan. sa ko fa Basically, get up and go and get whatever crap you have left on the floor in your bedroom. A.K. Pimenta, a Ghanaian poet, um, has written a very difficult to find pamphlet which sort of uh, has poems for all of the different Adinkra symbols and um, Sankofa is at the centre. And for Sankofa he writes, the bird is wise, its beak turned back, picks for the present. What is best from ancient eyes then steps forward on her head to meet the future undeterred. If you think about Sankofa, Sankofa travelled with the enslaved on slave ships. It went to the Americas, the Caribbean, to Europe. It went with those that travelled from the southern states of America to the north. It travelled on the Empire Windrush and other boats and planes. It accompanies all migrants of African descent in boats, in their bodies, in the food, in the dance, it moves, and in the songs and in the workshops. In, and in worship so what am I doing with my work so I'm going to when I leave I'm going to show you some clips from um, an ongoing quite recent project which is called the queen in the black eyed squint you'll see um, one of the sources that sort of inspires the film so that's a clip from Pathé, the Pathé newsreel but for me the 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 kind of work on um, on archives or memory is what I call undoing, undoing. And I use undoing from uh, Ama Atta Edu's um, poem, As Always a Painful Declaration of Independence, where she talks about undoing as the plots that people are trying to do um, in a kind of anti-colonial anti struggle. And Sadia Hartman's idea of undoing in her book, in her, her essay, The Undoing of the Plot. I also think with Sankofa as a, Sankofa as a, um, a descendant epistemology, something that cannot be contained by archives. And I think this with uh, Ebony Coletu, who tells stories of finding information um, from kind of people that she's exploring in the archives, not in the archives, but in the streets and in ways in which she kind of will ask questions just of material for it to send her the information. And she finds it out in different ways. So I've been thinking about this as a kind of living practice, as that something that kind of is alive and something that is kind of present, like like Toni Morrison describes rememory. It is something that kind of you can go to a spot and actually you don't even know whether that memory is even yours. It's the way in which our kind of um, memories are contained and live within the body they are timeless you know they have they have yeah they, they they are timeless so they so I think one of those things comes across in my films as well is like there is an impossibility of containing it in an archive as in an architecture of archive and this to me is the kind of 
this sort of uh, way in which I'm describing this thing that's whispering. It's unruly and it will come at me at any time. And it would be, it can be anything like going to Ketakuti and, you know, suddenly someone starts speaking to me in Dutch and I suddenly understand and they understand. And then we kind of know that we are somehow connected or it's going to the Gambia and and arriving in what they call Ghana town and being able to kind of decipher something between us. I'm going to just kind of end this here with more from Foluke. Unruly movements in archives, listening to the stories, assisting in telling, in the telling, new formulations, new tellings, what might have been, putting the word evidence to our decolonial to our decolonial lexicon, asking questions about what is evident, obvious to the eye, consulting more eyes, or who else, what else, and from where else can we see, listen and know, reclaiming sense and sensitivity as roots to knowledge and as knowledge itself, practising sensitivity as capacity building, to fabulate critically requires hearing across a range of frequencies, the willingness and audacity to draw from multiple archives, the spin and the weave whereby the unverifiable archival dust, bone, memory, and that's a song playing in the background, is given its due. Sensing, reading, listening, watching, conversing, thinking, imagining, writing, writing, conjuring what might have been. If anyone had told her that she would want to pass through England because it was her colonial home, she would have laughed. She generally considers herself too smart to exhibit such weaknesses. But he had gone anyway, consoling herself all the while that that was the only way to get people at home to understand where she had been, abroad, overseas. Nyam nyamba, nyamba, mvaram varamba, mvaramba, ngwang baram baramba, mvaramba, ngwang laram laramba, bena nangba ya table ba, table ba e, table ba, table ba e, bena nangba ya, table ba, wula table be, lab lab e, table ba, tanso table tia, lab lab e, Monica won the competition. She became the first, the first ever Miss Ghana. Monica Amikofia. 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 They made such a big deal about her name meaning kingmaker and the appropriateness of this for a beauty queen. A beauty queen that had gone to Abrochi to represent a brand new country. Her brand new country, Ghana. Beba do de ba ye de di de ya Do be de di di de da Be de di de bo di de Be bo ye ndu ba ya e di If I die of a man's love, I'm nothing but 
got a mad Thank you, Barry. And first, my thanks to Amal Alag for doing this urgent, important work and making space in these institutions. Um, and these conversations are often limited to the public side, but an archive, or more specific, a colonial archive, forces us to get to the heart of the matter, because archives are the foundation of the historical stories we tell in these spaces, whether it's an exhibition or a documentary or a film. So I would like to focus on the institutions who are keeping, preserving, and providing access to these audiovisual archives. And the first question that comes to my mind watching and researching these films, I spent hours at Sound of Vision just watching these uh, colonial films. Um, and the first question that comes to my mind when watching uh, these films are why were these films being produced? For what purpose? And can these films produced within a colonial context have any significant meaning for society now? And whose legacy do they represent? What can we learn? The colonial archive is an inherently problematic space for knowledge making and memory. So as historian Akil Membe has pointed out, museums, and the same applies to archives, or in general, memory institutions are not dumping places where history's waste is recycled, but epistemic places where knowledge is being produced. So memory institutions have a large responsibility in dealing with colonial past and colonial uh, archives, whether it's the archival collection of Tropen Museum, I Museum, or the National Archives of the Netherlands, because to quote Membe, they cannot hide anymore behind the wall of innocence by stating that they are acting as neutral intermediaries between past and present. Inaction by memory institutions is not neutral either. Inaction means that current oppressive structures are supported. And what can we learn from these archival film collections? And what we can learn from these archival film collections is that these oppressive structures did not come out of thin air. So when it comes to taking accountability or responsibility towards these colonial audiovisual archives from these memory institutions, just holding the door open and saying everybody is welcome is not enough. Or changing your mission statement. So how does taking responsibility and accountability looks like in every area of archival work, be it, be it collecting, preserving, describing, terminology, and language exposes this inequality or giving access. So when working with these audiovisual archives, to quote Charles Jurgens from, Jurgens from the UVA, um, the relationship between institution use, user should not be framed and organized as a relationship between provider and end user, but as a relationship of interaction between equal stakeholders. And if we acknowledge and consider the existing mechanisms and e unequal balance of power within these archives, the violence, the racist images, and the descriptions, framing, and also the reproduction of trauma, then maybe that's a lesson of how we can work with these uh, colonial archives. I was just thinking I haven't introduced myself. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I'm Jeff Tapatikawa. I work at the National Archive of the Netherlands. Before this, I worked at Van Albe Museum, Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam. Um, and the archive has always played a central part in my work. Uh, now I work at the National Archives of the Netherlands, where I work on accessibility of colonial archives, uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, multifocality, um, and all the challenges that come when working with these uh, colonial archives. Um, in 2015, uh, I started an own archive, or we built an, ar an, an community archive, and it started um, actually in, well, in 1976, 
just 80 kilometers from here, 14 October of 1976, um, the Barrow Camp, the Mullican Barrow Camp where my family lived, uh, uh, was... Uh, uh, there was a violent eviction on 14 October 1976, so a lot of families lost their uh, barracks, their personal belongings, um, because the rumor went there were uh, heavy weapons in our community. Well, where does this story come from? Uh, uh, so the intelligence servants thought there, was, there were we heavy weapons in our community. But if you look at uh, Moluccan history, especially Dutch colonial history, uh, Moluccan people has always been framed in the archives as, or loyal, indispensable, um, ferocious uh, soldiers, or uh, uh, radicalists in the 70s. If you look at the actions in the 70s, like the, uh, the trains or, the, uh, or other actions by uh, Moluccan youth way then. Um, I think this is a long story. I think uh, when I say I'm Molokan, a lot of people in the Netherlands knows these histories. But if you uh, look at the archives, um, Moluccan people are framed as um, radical, uh, angry, uh, 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 traumatized. So what to do with this uh, frame, which is, uh, um, which is in the archives, especially in the colonial archives? Um, well, uh, Michel Rolf Truyot, in his book, uh, it's called uh, Silence the, Silencing the Past, uh, Power and the Production of History, talks about how silences enter the process of historical production at four crucial moments. So first, the making of sources. Two, the making of archives. Three, the making of narratives. And four, the making of history in the final instance. So the position of Molokans in the Netherlands is influenced by colonialism. And as I said before, the image of Molokans in the Netherlands is um, formed by resistance, protest, radicalization, and violence. So um, six years ago, I found an old picture uh, in the photo family album with four people um, they were uncles of mine, carrying professional equipment, cameras, uh, microphones. And the first thing I thought when I saw this picture, why are they carrying uh, cameras? So I went to research this story, and uh, after this forced eviction of 1976 and the state violence, um, the community isolated. They didn't trust any uh, organizations, um, but the drug uh, abuse and the unemployment uh, problems were, were growing. Um, so they started their own relief, their, their own um, uh, uh, they, 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 they could see they didn't, uh, nobody, nobody helped them, so they started to look for own solutions. Um, and one of these uh, projects they set up to help their, uh, to help the community, was to um, uh, start a, a video project. Video was a rare medium that day, those days. It was the end of the 1970s. So they started uh, just filming daily life around them. Um, there were several projects to help the people. Um, and this project was called Chermin, which means mirror in uh, Malak Malay. So, they were filming their community, uh, our, our community, um, and uh, uh, from 1979 until 1995. Um, so I was researching this story, and I talking to one of these uh, uh, video crew members, and he said, yeah, we have all the tapes, I have all the tapes on my attic. So we went to his attic, and there I found this treasure of, like, 300 uh, professional videotapes um, with, with all the work of this, this video group. So um, the first thing, well, looking at these uh, videotapes, we thought like, okay, we looked at it for nostalgic reasons because you see uh, family, you see friends. Um, 
but then we were thinking, uh, uh, this is an archive too. So we went to Sound and Vision in, in Hilversum, and, but unfortunately they rejected us with the reason, no, we have a lot of material about mollicans. And um, so that's the, that's the first uh, um, uh, time we got rejected. Um, and then after uh, organizing exhibitions with the community, uh, looking at these videotapes, um, showing them, um, uh, organizing walks, or remembrance walks, uh, after all, uh, building relationships is part of the ar archival process too. So, um, yeah, that's when we just that, that's when we discovered, hey, we have an we have an own uh, archive too. So um, we started to make films, and not for aesthetic uh, uh, cinematic reasons, but just to show uh, self representations, the resilience, just to make things with these with these archives. Um, so. Uh, Last year, we organized uh, uh, a remembrance walk to, uh, and it was the first time after this forced uh, eviction, the state's violence on the 14th October, 1976. Um, and thanks to this archive, thanks to these uh, tapes, people were talking about uh, the day what happened. They never talked about, the, about this event before, but we could see the archive was, um, was activating people to tell their stories. But on the other hand, um, there was this uh, state archive too of, of, this, of this day, 14 October 1977, the, the forced eviction. Um, and that's, well, that, that, this was a strange thing because people, um, sometimes it was the first time they saw these, these uh, state archives and they were seeing themselves, they were seeing their barracks, they were seeing the uh, police brutality, actually. And um, so that was a challenge on how to work with colonial archives and um, how to build an own, uh, an own archive. Um, so after the remembrance uh, walk, the national TV, the news, they all uh, broadcasted it. Um, and the archive itself is being kept by the het Gelders Archief. It's an, uh, um, but the rights are within the community itself. Um, so that's, that's when we were working with um, uh, our own archive producing uh, films, um, well, we discovered like the older generation who was uh, part of this um, uh, uh, who witnessed this day or saw their barracks being uh, demolished. Um, that's when we discovered like um, uh, what's 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 the uh, um, where should we focus on? Should we focus on our community archives or um, what's the role of this colonial archive? Um, but one thing we, we knew sh for sure, uh, this project is still running, was that um, the Colonial Archive didn't show our uh, resistance, didn't show our resilience. And uh, what we see in, what we saw in our own archives was, um, was, uh, was were things in life's colon uh, estate archives could never uh, preserve or uh, present, because the Flora and Bondland archive was about the resilience and the resistance of the community, and more important, it was about love and not the romantic kind of love, but uh, the older lord all about love kind of love. Like it was about nurturing, it was about care, it was about uh, taking care of each other, and taking responsibility. So that's, uh, I hope I could show you the difference between a colonial archive and a community archive. Thank you. Thank you, um, Barbie and um, Jephthah.
and um, for all of you listening attentively to images, voices, and worlds. Um, I didn't introduce initially why I invited you uh, both, partially because I felt both of you, um, I, was, I was excited to be in conversation with people that have an understanding of institutional archives, but at the same time are have been f um, working towards other ways of being, remembering, and gathering together in witnessing. I think in a way what Barbie was speaking about um, when you were bringing forward unruly therapies of Fluke um, Taylor, Fluke Taylor, Fluke's um, a book, I was thinking about what it means to do for oneself. And I felt both of you are very equipped and have the abilities to um, produce and think and work through imaginative ways of being together with others. So it's, it's also, that's why I invited you. And I was to be in conversation, so um, I'm very excited about that. And, and, I, and I wanted to come back to all the different ways of troubling um, the archive, but I wanted to maybe start with the different ways one could trouble the colonial gaze. And I, and I do think it's important what Barbie mentioned is that we're not talking only about archives, aesthetic sites, but we're talking about archive and the formation of the institution and as sites of knowledge production in relation to how you introduced the museum and museum work. And, um, and yeah, and, and this idea of memory work, but also the performance of citizenship. That's something I always want to bring forward, that the archives, the collections are sites of what the nation, the state, wants to remember into the future. And I think it's important that, you know, sometimes we need to dismantle the present or abolish the past <laughs> to a degree without abolishing <laughs> the past um, to reconfigure the futures that it allows the different voices to be present. And it's not only about the present, but also be stakeholders, as you mentioned, Jeffta. So thank you, both of you. Yeah, so I wanted to start um, uh, by talking about the colonial, um, you know, um, as Jeffta said, so many of us are invited to hang out and spend time with these archives. And then you start looking at these, I this kind of material, and you're like, I know this. Do I really need to suffer through the violence of seeing this? And I remember telling maybe Dorette that I was like, oh, but uh, working for years at the um, uh, Research Center for Material Culture, um, I've seen the stills of the films that are here. So I've seen all the separate stills from many of the films, and I'm like, I know these films. So let me fast forward to the point where I can, you know, dive deeper and listen more in depth. So I, yeah, and but so many artists, uh, so many different people are struggling with like, how do you live with these archives? I wanted to both of you talk a bit more about, you know, um, what it's like for you to go through these processes. Um, also, Barbie, in your work, you juxtaposition and layer different images, your own, the ones the newly shot, but also the past, that's a technique. So maybe you wanna s speak a bit more about that and, and also, this duality of how you are remembered by the state um, and how you remember oneself. Oh, you're my voice got my. I, I think that's so key, and I really appreciate. I don't know if my is my not is my working, um, and uh, I really appreciate what you brought forward in that whole thing of this, you know, the community archive and the the official, and it's still like that and. It's it's so still like that, like this the official stories and the and for me actually I th I suppose I came upon it accidentally. Um, I think living in a in a sort of area like living in Brixton. Um, actually, my first ever kind of memory project was was this. It was it was um, I was working as a kind of researcher. I was invited to work as a researcher on a project which was um, kind of, um, which which was a, an exhibition called Brixton Studio, which was of 
um, these photographs that were once thrown in a skip. Right? The, um, they were photographs and negatives that of a um, photographer who had had a photographic studio on a street in Brixton, and he photographed over 50 years many of the kind of Afro-Caribbean community in the area. And when he closed his his um, you know his studio, he threw his photos, he threw all of that material into a skip. And um, someone came along and said, I'll give you 250 quid for all of those negatives. And what happened there was that the photographer's gallery in London decided they were doing this exhibition. And actually, there was a copyright issue. The issue being that the photographer doesn't own, if you do, if you do photos like that, the photographer doesn't own the copyright of those photos, the commissioner does. So they needed to get involved with the community, right? And so I was kind of living between the two. I was like working at the gallery, but I was also a Brixton resident. So they were like, do you think you could um, try and find the people who, so that we can get permission to show these photographs in the gallery? So, um, yeah, I did it. I was, you know, I was like, yeah, I did it. And I knew the ways to get involved, to, to get people. I knew the ways. But also what was really striking for me there was what was not said, what was not being able to be contained in this kind of photo photographic exhibition. You know, all the stories that were told to me that were, you know, of loss, of uh, experiences of being in Britain, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of memories, all kinds of... It's funny that I kind of talk about, you know, I kind of... I didn't realise I was doing that. I talk about the therapeutic, right? And thinking about with that, that actually it was... It was so cathartic for them to be able to talk to me. And even, and you know, in the institution, they were like, oh, we'll have a separate private view for them and we'll do this. And, 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 and then there was no care taken after that to actually even house, to think about where we want, might house these photos and actually think about, you know, what this means as social history. And and, and that's when I started to make memory work because I just responded to that because it actually came out of fury. I was so angry. And initially I started making work with, um, with communities like uh, around music, around kind of memories, kind of uh, doing performative gestures. And then 2000, this work came out in 2016. It was the 50th anniversary, or of 60th anniversary of the independence of Ghana. My grandmother had just died. And I was just looking for ways. So there's a kind of, I was just trying to look for ways of, of kind of attending to a story that I didn't know. And, you know, the clip was found. And, and then it's just kind of like how to sort of build those things that, I don't know how to kind of be with that. I don't know, but to kind of imagine that stuff that I don't know. Um, and to kind of also attend to the injustice. Or I, you know, I took it the, the, the unconsidered stories. Um, that's how I kind of started to come to memory work. Am I answering all your questions? I think it's uh, associative thinking together. Okay, no so problem. <laughs> we, we can, yeah. I wonder, Jeff, if you could also respond to this, you know, I guess in, in, conversation. in conversation with Barbie and uh, uh, to respond to this kind of, you know, state, um, state narrative in the archive versus one's own, you know, imaginative abilities to imagine an archive, which was a profound moment that they decided to actually collect their own um, stories, tell their own stories. Yeah, and uh, these are uh, complete different spaces. And I noticed it when I was just giving the presentation. It's the first day, actually, I'm presenting, presenting both sides of my work, mm. like working in a state archive and working on a community archive. So um, maybe you know this, but when I was talking about the community archive, I was like, Emotion. yeah. And um, I think that uh, it's the first time I'm just presenting these uh, two 
archives in the same space. Um, so I think there's a, maybe it's resistant in me, like maybe the story of this narrative doesn't belong here in this uh, space. So there's this big, there's this uh, boundary. Um, but what, what causes that boundary? You know, is it that you oneself are in some sort of, that you are the lingua franca, you know, in a way, always in translation, moving between these worlds, or... Yeah, and, and I think working with colonial archives or working with audiovisual archives and just looking at the images, um, when we acknowledge these structures or these toxic ideologies are still existing, um, we'll just go to, uh, for example, the financial district, Southos, or uh, any other places where you could see the same sceneries like white people um, and where are the brown and black people um, and what are they doing there um, so working with a lot of uh, institutions memory institutions museum archives uh, and their um, uh, their ways of trying to engage with audiences um, uh, and uh, well how there's always like um, uh, these, these, uh, how even these uh, partnerships uh, or relations are not equal. Mm -hmm. Like, um, um, I see a lot of examples of people who um, were invited to uh, to give a presentation or to dance or to bring food, but in the end, all the decisions around these archives uh, or what to do with the archives, who's working on it. Um, well, it's almost the same scenery as we see in these in these movies. Mm -hmm. So I think this uh, uh, this is what we can learn from these archives uh, too, and this is what we as a community can learn from seeing these films or uh, 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 seeing how institutions work around these uh, topics. Yeah, no, I, I I think it's so important that you also brought in kind of the power relations and how they, in a way, are... To be in the afterlife is to be still caught up in the same power relations. And um, and I think it's it's sometimes also, for whom is this just work and from whom is this their lives, you know, depicted? And I think that's, that's always the difficult space to move in between, that one can also... I always think about how one of my friends was capable of jumping ship. I call it jumping ship when you can just decide to have a different job or to do something else. And for some people, you feel like a responsibility that is a lifelong responsibility. It has no end game. You might not, you might not even get there. The, <clears throat> the political gesture, the pol politics involved in the work. So, you know, that's for me, you know, I was motivated by kind of a, an, en an enraged moment of seeing this disregard for people's stories and this kind of the way in which I can bring some regard and care into that, into those kind of, you know, that's what I'm interested in, in doing. So, you know, even the footage that you saw in the films, the, the um, archival footage, you know, well, it's something that I, I would, I call my, one of the practices that I have is that every now and again, I do it with records as well, is I um, just trawl eBay and other places to just find stuff that I will, I say, I will rescue. It is, you know, kind of Ghana, it's mostly Ghanaian related, and I will try and kind of, and, and that was one that thing that I found that I just, and it was, a, it was actually from DEFA, the mm -hmm. East German, and I try to make contact with them and I try to kind of like, you know, the people who have the archive, tell them I was going to use the material, um, you know. And it was just this discarded can of Super 8 film, which happened to be film footage of 1957 in, in Ghana. And, you know, I, I'd never seen that. That's what, that for me as well, that on a kind of, you know, therapeutic level, it was like I could see the Ghana my mom and my grandmother lived in you know I, I could see that and and you know so there is so much sort of disregard for this stuff and even when you kind of when you know when you go to Ghana I go to Ghana and you try and look in archives 
the technology is such that it's been created in the West, right? So the technology is such that, you know, so much is like deteriorating. and But I think there's something in that deterioration as well. And I also think that I'm also going to put in the kind of, I just think sometimes, just thinking about your what you were saying about the projects and working in institutions, I think this kind of proposition that comes forward from them, like to look at the archives, to decolonize, I think it's an absolute impossibility unless we had, unless you have these kind of like, and also maybe the possibility that you might actually also allow yours to go to dust. Yeah. Like you were saying, you know, that it might actually just deteriorate, that it might actually just... I think, you know, then we're we're entering the, the space of people's jobs, you know? Well, and then we the question, are, we've talked about The, the politics always comes back into, are you willing to lose your job? You know, like, I mean, this is, I feel, if we're going to bring forward kind of, are we willing, that's why at the end I brought in transformative justice in relation to the archive and abolition work. Like, I'm always willing to lose my job, but I cannot expect that of other people's. Mm. But sometimes I have to demand because otherwise we're in a circulation of this economy, you know, there's either the economy of the political refugees, you know, the whole like UN system and like you need more refugees to keep that system alive. In a way, you need more archives <laughs> to keep the uh, archives or you need to stay in the particular era. I think that's another thing. But I, what I noticed, and this is also the question of why I work against um, professionalism, because when you talk to people who've been working with some of these archives and collections since the 70s and even the 80s, even the 90s, it was super unprofessional compared to today's time. You know, like now I have to wear gloves, I have to like do this whole social uh, hygienic thing to even enter a space. Like I feel like I get a DNA spray, <laughs> a collection DNA spray type of experience, and then you're allowed to enter. And then by the time you enter, you are clean according to, but imagine if you bring a bug. You know, imagine if a bug is like, this is, I'm now speaking about the Topa Museum and the, you go six feet underground and, and all. The isolation yeah, rooms. Yeah, and, and, and this is, I think, the, the, the complexities that only a few decades ago, some of these kind of bureaucratic systems and technologies have not, were not perfected. So there's this ongoing perfection and the more, which means it moves away further and further away from the communities because the communities bring the food and the food might be contaminated <laughs> and you know and or they bring sweat because they s or spit or just alive they're it alive it makes me think the last scene because i just showed you clips from the five films the last film the uh, one in the museum store is uh, we go into an isolation room and inside that isolation room are all the um like uh, banners and you know uh placards and everything that was made for the Black Lives Matter po protests mm -hmm. in 2020 in, in Glasgow. And um, it's waiting there to be debugged and cleaned and this and that. And, you know, and th this, uh, this wasn't the only museum that collected, you know, went no. and collected this. I mean, um, actually it was global. They're kind of collecting now. I, th I think it's an interesting kind of, because it's also, you know, pens that are going to, you know, it's whatever anyone found. It's sellotape that's not going to stick anymore. It's, you know, ha it's all of this. And I, I, I liked that intervention, but I also find it very interesting that museums thought, well, to keep relevant, we need to collect this stuff. <laughs> you know, and we need to collect 2020 and this is 2020. Yeah without learning from all the things people have been talking well, you about. you can't collect the people, a virus, can you? That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> a different thing. I wanted to open up and then maybe come back to Jephthah to talk a bit more about the juxtaposition between the colonial archive, the colonial, um, um, and, and to kind of think a bit more about what spaces of imagination does the community work create, also in healing practices or this care practice, because I think that's important to reclaim care a bit. Um, I don't know if there are any questions or comments or trouble. Um, yes, you were talking about um, working against professionalism. And um, I was wondering, what do you think at the moment about all kinds uh, of attempts to decolonize, how you call it, uh, 
and I have to think, for instance, about the movie or uh, White Balls in the Stedelijk Museum. And uh, I would like to know uh, your opinion, what you, what you can analyze from this film. Um, I'm, I'm not the right person to talk about <laughs> cultural diversity and inclusion projects, but um, I, I mean to, to speak about it, you know, because one, I, I'm a firm believer that we need killjoys, people who are against all forms of, you know, inclusion without having self-determined ways of decision making. And at the same time, we need people that believe in representation and that want to enter spaces. And I'm saying this from a place that I've been in an outsider for the past 20 years. Like I've worked in and outside, just like Jephta, you know, that you are moving in and out. And I call it the work of shape-shifting. But my, I think, I think with this, this film really touches on a painful moment, I think, in Dutch hist history, or actually it's an evidence of a moment of transformation that is very uncomfortable. And since we like to be people with good intention, um, discomfort is, a, is not pleasing, I think, because I've heard from different people in the museum world that, oh my God, this film, you know, it's troubling. It's, bit, yeah, know. so it's basically this filmmaker followed um, the uh, Stedelijk Museum going through the transformation of becoming more inclusive, more inclusive um, collection, but also the team. And I think by now it actually is quite a, a diverse team. There are different voices, the pluriversal team now. But at the same time, the critique that comes from everyone and their mother, mostly white Dutch <laughs> artists, art historians, uh, journalists, is that it is too identity politics, which is now a fascist way of saying is too many people of color speaking. And I think that's that's also part of the discussion at the moment, you know, instead of making it nice, I think everyone should fight it out. And then by the time people fight out, we get to see who's injured, who comes out, <laughs> doesn't want to work in the arts anymore. But what's happening is that while this train of inclusion is continuing, at the same time, there's a counter movement happening of fascism, of people being wanting to keep the Dutch colonial nostalgic image you know, the same that the past of the Netherlands is about beautiful farms and you know you see the same beautiful cows. Like I think also the power of imagery and um, the idea of what a good Dutch citizen is, mm -hmm. is represented in also how we want our art to be. And I think this film is in a way troubling that. But at the same time, it is, in my opinion, keeping the status quo. Mm -hmm. A lot about it is about the director, no disrespect to him, but <laughs> and it's about his policy and his very weird position of the other person that is an important force in the museum. But I don't know, Jephthah, you're a troublemaker in, in the Dutch museum world, so well, <laughs> you might know uh, more. Well, I worked at the Stedelijk <laughs> for, um, before they were filming the documentary, mm. so then I went to uh, National Archives of the Netherlands. Um, and I agree with what you say. And in Holland, there's this uh, saying, like, everything has to be gezellig. Like, cozy, gezellig. It moet allemaal wel gezellig blijven. Like, you can discuss this, themes, you can talk about colonization, about coloniality, but it has to stay gezellig. Um, and I think this is a form of oppression, uh, too. Uh, it's, 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 it's nice racism, as I read an article last, uh, last week. I don't know the author anymore. Sorry for this. Um, but uh, I could write a book about this, um, well, diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives. Um, uh, and just to go a step back, it's not only about, uh, when we talk about archives, archival systems, it's not only, only about the film we're watching, but it's about the whole interface. And it's about people working on uh, descriptions, it's about distributing, it's about preserving. Um, uh, and, uh, well, one of the, when I just started doing this work, um, we were discussing diversity and inclusion policies in one room. I don't say which museum or which archive, but we were discussing these policies. 
And in the other room, seriously, uh, Black Pete was dancing on in the canteen and throwing gingerbread. So that's 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 uh, uh, how it works. When you, uh, that's what you see in a lot of museum and, and memory institutions. Um, uh, and I started the pres I started the pro uh, presentation with. Uh, um, with this neutrality, I think like a lot of um, people working in these museums see themselves as neutral. Like, oh, it's about diversity and inclusion. We have we just hired someone for that, yeah, or um, like, yeah, and these these kind of uh, um, I think this is um, mm -hmm. a part of the oppression we we can't acknowledge and we don't see. Yeah. Just pick up. Um, I think it's really, it's really important for people to really get decolonization and d de and like diversity are not the same thing. They're really not the same thing. But yet, time and time and time and time again, you hear that decolonization is deep process work. It is work that not only requires me to do work. It requires everybody to do work and it requ requires a, a kind of really like, you know, that's why I think when I'm, I quote um, Brooke Andrew, you know, um, I'm saying when he said therapy helps, a therapeutic helps, it hurts to do this work. It hurts to do decolonial work because the the. You know, and it can't it can't be just cultural institutions. It really can't. It can't be this work that is done within a cultural institution. It's not work that's done by, you know, putting up more, you know, paintings or whatever. This is work about land. This is a work about, you know, kind of epistemologies. This is work about religion. This is work about our very souls, about, you know, our food, everything. So I think that 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 sometimes for me I think the failure is is that people do spend so much time on this like well, you know the visual the visual the visual and the being nice and let's like keep it all nice and I love what you said about you know let's fight it out we need to fight it out because this is difficult work this is grief work and that's something that I kind of really felt really happy to be working with the Scottish Museums when we were doing that work because they, they went beyond that. The curator that I worked with went beyond that. We were in grief work, right? We were in grief work. The people that were invited to be part of the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we went to the local council. We were in conversation this was with, with like regular Scottish folks, with activists. They're all kind of part of particularly the, t the, three, the three films that include the dance and the, you know, we were dancing to the organ while we were dancing to, to... So we were having... We were in dialogue, and it hurt at times. And we had, you know, like you were showing, like, you know, we had emotion. And the thing is, I think sometimes the difficulty is is being with that emotion. I do another performance work where people really can't... They have to sit with the emotion, like sit with the discomfort and the emotion because... The grief is not just mine, it's everybody's, right? It's everybody's because this is how we fucked up our world, you know? We did it in 500 years. So, yeah, and... and uh, you can go ahead. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, well, working on these this, this themes, like diversity, inclusion, or multifocality, or accessibility, um, what I noticed in the past eight years, a lot of institutions um, uh, used are mixing up this terminology mm -hmm. to centralize whiteness. Yeah. If they talk about multifocality instead of decolonization, mm -hmm. it be it's because the white voice has to be present yeah, in this demodernization. <laughs> that they do, that yeah. they too, and. Yeah. Um, that's why terminology or uh, definitions are are important, uh, not only for the institutions, but on, but especially for the communities. Are, yeah. And, and can we agree with these definitions or these terms? Or 
I just wanted to add because I feel class is a big thing also. Like a lot of people of color were, a lot of these institutions were already so-called, people were being included just, you know, more in the class positions of security, cleaners, you know, and, and I think it's class, class, race and gender is this big major playground. So thank you for extensively answering the questions. Um, and I wanted to open it up. We, um, I think there was a question or comment somewhere in that region. And then there's here and there's here and we have, let me check because I know some people want to eat, the, the team wants to eat and <laughs> have some water. Um, we have like uh, 50 minutes. So maybe we just go through the questions, we gather them and then we talk about it. Yeah, thank you very much, Amal. Um, I'm a filmmaker myself. And I'm very much interested, besides the very interesting institutional, institutional discussion we had just now, about uh, the way you, you, <coughs> you presented your own the material you were presenting, the Lamster material, which I was uh, very much surprised because I think it's very brave because you, you, you really went back to the material itself and tried to find out I don't know exactly what, but you try to find out to find something in it. Uh, because you work on the material, you zoomed in, you took out some context or, or whatever. And I'm wondering, maybe you could explain a little bit what you think you found. Because I, I, I felt there was a certain tenderness in what I saw. Mm -hmm. In images of what I know when you see them in the full context are colonial images still by a filmmaker that was not a real filmmaker in the sense that he had a, a, a complete other pace than, for instance, the pate material. Um, so I was really wondering what you encountered there. Um, yeah, thank you for this question. Um, my Just to briefly answer, I see myself really, my, uh, it's this kind of what I call as the dirty... Uh, work. It's like the care work. It's like the cleaning up but holding space. So it was an attempt to hold space for questions. I mentioned that in my fast-paced uh, introduction. Um, I was. There's nothing more to seek than questions because the images we know because they're always still in the afterlife, whether that is true, the uh, racial connotation and the depiction of Asian people, which is something I feel we need to have a whole conversation about, racial tropes, Indonesia, uh, the Dutch Indies, that whole colonial, which is still present in the way many people, children of um, previous generation of Dutch um, people who lived in Indonesia, the way they remember Indonesia, the way they remember the Dutch Indies, the way they remember the Moluccans, the different communities that were are still struggling to a degree for independence. So what does it mean also as a outsider, uh, myself, to hold space for histories that you see in the everyday presence, the way that people talk about the food that they're um, grandmother cooked or the way you find out that they're white passing is a whole conversation we had, we're not talking about in the Netherlands the amount of people who are white passing and then you see them in a photo with the family members and you're like oh you have an Indonesian family member like there's this past in your family this colonial past and then they open up and I find that the way the um, let's say the the black Dutch histories is echoing loudly because there's also a comfort of seeing depicting the bodies the presence the anger of black people the way black people are racialized in the colonial and slavery afterlives versus the way the Dutch in these pasts are racialized in our presence they're very different but they deserve equal different type of attention um, and there's now this hype machine around slavery past, you know, of course, because rah, 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 it's uh, 150 years, I think, this year. So there's a whole financial argument why we need to focus. But this is, as Barbie said, grief work for multiple generations. So how do we hold space for that when the money runs out? I think so this was an attempt to hold space for when the money is not even there <laughs> for, for these histories, but also a way to push us to rethink how we depict people that did not choose to show up in these images. And I think that's the toughest because sometimes it means we really need to not use them anymore or maybe 
distort them. So when I talk, when I, I worked with Jasper, um, he's part of the collection uh, team here at the museum, and he was so generous uh, to sit with me for two hours. And in the beginning, I had to remind him. I was like, I need, um, we need to kind of do this more like it can be very uh, sloppy. And then he looked at me like, what do you mean sloppy? And I was like, okay, you just cut there and there, and then you zoom in. So we practiced a few times and then he got it and he was like, oh, I can do this. And he was telling me like how he thought um, that it was something completely different than what he normally does, although his work is daily different. I think the I team is familiar with his work. Um, so I have to acknowledge also that he was the one who helped me do that work. Um, yeah, so thank you for that question. I think there was somewhere here a few more. Ying? Maybe I think Tessa is coming. Can you hold up your hand because of uh, Yeah, and then and then maybe we gather them in one go because this was not that. Oh. Okay, I have to stand up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hi. Hi Ying. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentations today and this super important work that you're presenting. Um I want to ask you about the um, uh, anti-colonial strategies that you see. Because we can talk a lot about inclusion and diversity. I think decolonization is one of these words, you know, another checklist. Or like, a, yeah, think you of the list. Uh, <laughs> so it can be empty, yeah? So I think that um, I'm very curious to hear how you see this anti-colonial strategy. Because if we are to face this violence, and if we are to heal from all that trauma that's being launched at us through the gaze of someone else, like that's rough. And I think that critical fabulation offers us a way, you know, we have resistance, we have resilience, we have survival, um, and it's all there, even if it's not verified. So while doing this kind of parallel work, you know, like build our own while fighting it out, I want to ask you about the anti-colonial strategy that you see here. I, I think I would like to maybe give the word to Jephthah because I feel the film archive of the collective of family mm. members and people, I think that is, to me, the anti-colonial work. So maybe you want to answer. Um, yeah, and when I was discussing this with, with family members or people who are part of this community archive, um, and then I was speaking with them about uh, uh, anti-colonial or decolonial, the reaction was, but why do we have to compare our archive with any colonial archive? Um, uh, and I was th thinking about this, and they were right, because um, um, that's the beauty of our own community archive. Um, it, has, it has our stories in it, it has daily life, uh, the building of a church, uh, songs, you can hear how uh, the Moroccan Malay eventually entangled in Dutch language. Um, uh, so yeah, that was an eye-opener for me, like uh, this community archive is, uh, is everything except colonial. So why should we think in terms as anti-colonial or decolonial? Because I think these are institutional uh, discussions. And um, uh, yeah, so did I answer your question or? Yeah, yeah, I, and I just want to, because we have like around 10 minutes max, so I just want to pick up a few more questions. Yeah, go no, ahead. I don't think I'm on. I, I think you're so right. I think this, we have that language. I have that language as my bridge, my bridging thing, but I see what I would say is I could label as anti-colonial all the time, but without the language of it. I remember one of my students once saying to me, because I teach a course which is basically anti-colonial in an art school in London, and um, my, one of my students said to me, uh, when it came to sort of essay writing time, I want to write an essay on trap. And I was just like, you see, we don't really have that because it wasn't something that was it's a trap music, you know, it's like, you know, street music. We don't have a have a kind of, you know, educational framework for that. 
But yet these things are happening all the time, all the time. The ways in which, you know, the the voices of domestic workers get together to sing or eat together or kind of there's all it's always happening. And it happens like that really in our ways to, that that was the way that the struggle happened. It came, it was two people talking, you know what, this this thing is not very... And, and that's how the, the struggle happened. And I think we need to look at those... Like, I, I love this this project. There's a there's a guy in Brixton who filmed who, who himself, just himself. He, he didn't know he was doing that. He just kind of, like, liked filming. You know, all of this stuff is, like, gathering and kind of a momentum and those moments when people get together and cook together or whatever... Those are the tiny strategies. So all these like kind of big gestures, like we're going to decolonize that collection. You know, they're not really doing that much for the, for the struggle, really. Um, because really the struggle is also every day. It's how to live and endure and be every day and show up. Yeah, and I, and I think just to build bridges to other people, but I, I do th want to also that community work is not a romantic work, right? I think it's like very exhausting. People don't listen. Everyone talks at the same time. Like it's very messy work. And I, and I, because I think otherwise it's seen as juxtaposition. I think it's either in a binary way and it's quite non-binary in its positionality. And I think that's where it is, that it's very slow process and you have to wait for everyone. Half of the people don't show up. That's why earlier when I was asked, um, uh, uh, will everyone be there 30 minutes beforehand? I was like, I don't think so. It's just not going to work. The people that I invite to nobody <laughs> is capable of showing up. On, and I think that is exactly what it is. To open up means that also the structure of the institution or small ways inside of the institution has to change. That maybe you can come to film 10 minutes late, but that's my proposition, right? So <laughs> I'm, there's a reason why I'm not here, you know, like heading time. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, maybe there was in that corner and here and then, yeah, and then we can round it up. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your presentations. Um, I know that all archives have their own logic and uh, sometimes they speak to you and reveal themselves to you and then other times they become elusive. And that also, I think, is something to be respected. But I was wondering, with your experiences working in different archives, would you have advice to offer of how one might approach an archive? <laughs> Thank you. I, I think, uh, you, you, sh you, sh you know. <laughs> Why are you asking us the question? <laughs> OK. It still can be answered. There's question. Oh, there's another question there. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm. I don't claim the position of the artist, right? I am more like a bystander hanging out. Um, if I think about the my work at RCMC, I always had to find a white colleague to actually <laughs> enter the collection because I was kind of a person on grad. Like people were like the collection team was always thinking, oh no. There she comes. Let's just tell her it's going to take three months. And then I would find a nice white colleague, and they managed to get it in two weeks because people felt somehow you symbolize also trouble. I Me, mean, you are trouble, but you also start symbolizing inside of the organization trouble. And then I, I think it's it's just, you know, because you people sometimes also want you to be happy or to say, oh, we did such a good job together. And when I started always telling my colleagues, like, but why do we have to say we did a good job? It's okay, right? You're getting paid. That's fabulous. You have, at the end of the month, a salary. These people show up, and they do this work all year round. And then once in a while, we invite them, and we pay them 300 euros or 1,000 euros or 2,000, and that's it. And I was thinking about that type of dynamic, you know, like what do we ask of people when they actually get to work with the archive, you know? And also, one of the most difficult things is access. I think if... You have to talk, uh, touch base on this. Um, it's like the most difficult club to enter. The door bitch at the archive is evil. <laughs> if I have to be, like, it's so difficult. You don't even know where to find the email address. You know, then you email a person. Maybe that person works two days a week. You know, you need like, and then you come to the archive, and then you don't know how it works. You don't know the classification, the way the labeling works. 
um, I tried to tell one of the people that works here, oh, I know how to get around. And then I was like, oh, I kind of know, but some of the things I don't know, but it's the pandemic, so I can't go actually call people because they might not be there. So I started Googling to figure out how the eye system worked for myself because I know more than museum system, the more general museum system that is the form, the, the one that is known. But it's quite complex, so you actually... I, that's why at one point I started talking about you need to show up with a crew because it's very difficult to do this work by yourself as an individual. So that's why I always have a lot of respect also for artists that do long-term work with the archive. I think, um, um, yeah. Um, well, archives, uh, I think the, the main role of archives is to provide uh, uh, access to information. Um, but a lot of archivists, they believe they have a technical profession. Like it's only about uh, uh, giving access, it's about records, it's about um, uh, everything except, for example, the emotional accessibility. And, and, uh, and I think that's, that's, that's a problem when working with uh, colonial records um, or including people who are part of the histories of, of these histories too, but are um, silenced or histories are erased? I, I see a question, but yeah. sorry, I'm not the there, moderator. There was, yeah, you can respond, and then we, because we yeah, have question. there, and then one more there, and that's it. I, I'm going to just <laughs> respond to you because yeah. both, because I, I, I don't spend, I don't hang out in archives. I might make archives, and I was just thinking about the project I made around which I met you, to, to, uh, which was called the South London Black Music Archive. So it was like a propositional mm -hmm. archive. Like, when you talk about access, I was like, anyone can come. My, my archive was on Peckham Square. I had, like, the drunks coming into my archive. People brought their own items into the archive. You know, they brought their own music. Mm -hmm. Their own, they could sing, sit around and hang out and have music. There were bands playing that came and with quizzes and all kinds of things like that. So for, for me, we can't do that in an archive. We can't do that sociability in an archive. Um, and I'm really interested in how we can socially, like, commute, like archive together, you know? Mm -hmm. Then we can get an opportunity to this, dis, just, like, dismantle those stories that are very fixed yeah. and the architecture that is very narrow. Yeah, I think that's that's a very good additional point. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, and thank you, all of you, really, for um, the emotions and mentioning all of it. Um, my question is rather more about the emotions on the on the spectator's point of view. Um, speaking of viewing those archives or reviewing, you mentioned it with your first question. How does it feel for you to be faced with those colonial uh, images? My question might be. Personally, from my own experience, maybe, but, but <coughs> regarding frustration, uh, frustration of not being seen even when we are looking at those images, mm -hmm. frustration of what then happens uh, to those um, uh, archives from the state of going in and producing violence on those communities, and then us being having those documents, kind of, and still having nothing to be made of it in the sense of justice or whatever other word can be can be put on this but in the sense of how can can those archive uh, also produce frustration um, into communities who keep on realizing actually look I have those documents look I have proof look I do have all those things that showcase how you've treated me and yet here we are again I, yeah, thank you for this question. I, I think it's 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 kind of also what Jeff Zaha was alluding to. But I just briefly wanted to say my initial first idea was, oh, there are all these home videos of mostly white Dutch, you know, colonial officers. Why not, why does the museum not collect, you know, all the home videos of Moroccan, Turkish, all these different people that have been going on these journeys also on, like, um, back home, I feel so many people used, there is a different relation to home videos that at least coming from my own reality of my watching weddings because I could not attend weddings because it was too expensive for us to go to the US to see family or to the UK. So we would watch these home videos and then have the voiceover with 
some of my family members narrating it to you. Oh, look at cousin so-and-so. Oh my God, this person, you know? And, and I was thinking about what does it mean that a national archive, film archive, doesn't hold space for like a huge portion of Dutch society. Like, uh, and not only saying Dutch people have legally Dutch, but the people who live in this country. And I think what happens if your archive sits next to all these other different archives and that many of us can actually access because there's a dinner and drinks party, I don't know, somewhere once a month and there is a gathering. I don't know, I thought. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I was wondering if one of you want to respond to that and then we go to the last person. Uh, when working with these community archives and working in a, in a state archive, I'm very careful with um, um, like uh, bringing uh, amateur films or community films or to to this state archive, because um, if you're working on decolon to, to decolonize the institution, or uh, then you're actually acknowledging the same structures um, haven't changed yet. Mm. And the space haven't changed yet. Mm. And the people who are working it, with it uh, are still there. Are still there. Mm. So yeah. the interface has, hasn't changed. Mm. And what happens when we put this community films mm. in, this, in this archive? Mm. Um, yeah, so that's... Yeah, that's, that's why. I decided to do something else. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, because it would mean literally a multi-million euro project with maybe some like it's an impossible task to do in such a short time. Um, but indeed, at the same time, I think the question to many people working with the archive is how um, you know how do we reconfigure, make this new assemblage of memory, can spaces I, of yeah. memory? Can I, make this I, yeah. I don't know whether it's like to to put this stuff into... So I'm on the board of a gallery that I've been involved with for over 25 years. And um, we recently, we, we as a community organisation came out of Brixton riots um, and somehow became a kind of art gallery education space and kind of over years have shown like over 500 kind of artists of color, loads of different education programs, all kinds of things like that. So we put together our archive, like really in a quite unruly way. And also took on the archive of this guy, Clovis Salmon, who lived on the road. And we've been talking about other archives now, like there's a dance company that was in Britain from the 1980s, an African dance company, which is it's all really scattered. So we need to, to think really differently about that. And I think it's really important to not necessarily just think about them being collected by these organizations, but actually what, you know, if the if these government, this state people want to, um, you know, sort of be involved or think about or dress, readdress something, then give that money to these institutions within the community to decide what they want to do with those that material. In in a way, it indeed it turns to. There's the last question comment. Hi, Oof. my name is uh, Rene. I work in a regional archive. I'm the curator of a regional archive. We are very much open to people. People can come uh, to our space. We have community archives, state archives, everything is mixed. We have family films, it's a completely mixed bag. And um, I just want to make that point because it seems like every archive is closed in a way, the way you put it. Mm -hmm. uh, but two thirds of the information out there, audiovisual information, is in the regional scattered archives in the Netherlands. And I think it's, uh, it's not the same everywhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. The Netherlands have a specialty, or a specialty in this. But I think that uh, it might be interesting for researchers. I hope we once will have the money to have artists in residence like you. But I think it'll be mm -hmm. worth it to visit the regional archives as well. The Gelders Archief is where there is a re one of those regional archives. We talk to each other uh, four or five times a year. Uh, and we talk about this kind of stuff as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's important to just notice that we are there as well yeah. for uh, different kinds of archives than state archives. Yeah, 
No, thank you so much. And also, so you will give us your email address to everyone, so everyone is invited. We can all show up. <laughs> because not everyone here is from the city of Amsterdam, right? So, Groningen, <laughs> okay. See, now you have to name names so we can know how to find you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it. there's been a lot said, and I feel we can go on and on, but time is also running out. I want to really thank you so much, Barbie, um, for showing up, sharing film, being in conversation, also reminding us of the importance of different type of, you know, ways of creating for oneself, the unruly and the self-determined. And Jeff, so thank you so much also for like, you know, this being showing us what it means to be in this complex juxtaposition between the community work and the um, the national archive work and how it's difficult or maybe impossible to overlap them and they should not be overlapped. And um, thank you all really for like some of the engaging questions and input and feedback. I feel there's a lot to be said. For many of us, it's an ongoing conversation. So let's just call this iteration for what it is. Thank you so much. Just a closing word to thank you all very, very much. It has been a wonderful afternoon, a lot of things, food for thought, an ongoing conversation. Um, and uh, a special thank to Amal. It has uh, been great working with you throughout this extended residency, as you called. This is a closing moment, but actually I think it's just uh, the, a new beginning of uh, uh, a conversation. I think some of the um, what you said about uh, collaborations and uh, research is collaboration, work, archival work should be collaboration, and I think this I look forward to collaborating more and more, and also with Barbie and Jefta. It has been a pleasure having you here today. Uh, grief work, personally, I'm, I'm for it. I'm open for it. I'm ready for it. So I hope we'll, we'll do more of that. And um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I hope to see you back in three weeks for the session on This Is Film with uh, Oksana Sarkisova from uh, Vertio International Documentary Human Rights Film Festival in Budapest, who will be uh, discussing with uh, my dear colleague, uh, Floris Palman. So have a great evening. Thank you again.